I'm Sue Desmond Hellman. I'm Chancellor at University of California, San Francisco, and I want to tell you about the drug development story for Herceptin. Let me start by telling you about my background. I'm a medical oncologist by training. After medical school, I came to University of California, San Francisco, and did my training in internal medicine and then medical oncology, and had the great fortune during the last couple of years as a faculty member in the late 80s of spending time in Kampala, Uganda, as the leader of the adult cancer center caring for patients with Kaposi sarcoma. And a lot of my early thinking about product development actually came from the time I spent in Uganda caring for patients with Kaposi sarcoma and a real quest and a passion to make life better for patients. In the mid-90s, I came to San Francisco again to join Genentech, uh, the first biotech company, and had a lot of wonderful experiences in product development at Genentech. And one of those great experiences is the story that I want to tell you about today. So let's talk about some big picture things about great drug development. And when I say drug development, I mean the entire process of bringing an idea or a concept from the labs into the clinic and then to the, through the approval process so that the medicine can be broadly available for patients. First and foremost, and you can't do great drug development without it, you need a very deep understanding of the basic science. What's the hypothesis you're testing? What's the question you're asking? And does that question make sense, given the basic science and the fundamentals behind what you're trying to prove? The characteristics of the drug are important. If the drug doesn't get to the target, or it doesn't stay long enough in the circulation, the half-life, then you can't improve the outcome for that patient. Targeting the right patients or personalizing the therapy is the modern way to do drug development. And in part, it's the modern way to do drug development based on experiences like the one we had with Herceptin. Setting a high bar in the clinic isn't something everyone does. Uh, the risk of setting a high bar in the clinic is that you can fail. The benefit of setting a high bar in the clinic is that if you succeed, it matters a lot. It makes a big difference. People need to rewrite the textbooks, think again about what is possible for those patients. So setting a high bar in the clinic is the most inspirational way to do great drug development. And what I actually like most about great drug development is you don't do it alone. You have to work effectively with colleagues in a collaborative way, and you particularly have to work effectively with key regulatory decision makers. In America, that's the Food and Drug Administration, but there are similar bodies all over the world, and you have to work effectively with those regulators so you can do the clinical trials, and ultimately, so you can have broad applicability of your new product. So let me start the Herceptin story with telling you about the scientific rationale in breast cancer. And this story really rests on some critical information about the role of oncogenes in driving cancer. And this specific oncogene, human epidermal growth factor receptor 2, or HER2, is a gene that was thought to be associated with accelerating the growth of breast cancer. And the first clinical description of that growth acceleration came from Dennis Slayman and his colleagues as published in Science in 1987, and it's shown on this slide. If patients had too much HER2, either amplification or overexpression of HER2, as measured by FISH or immunohistochemistry, that was associated with a shorter survival. So about 25% of women in this trial were HER2 positive or overexpressing, and their median survival was only three years. Whereas the HER2 normal, about 75% of women who had a normal amount of HER2 lived a median of six to seven years. That's a dramatic difference, and that matters in the clinic. That had a big impact when I was a practicing oncologist on how I thought about the outcomes in those patients. So what that meant for a patient is she could only expect to live half as long as her fellow breast cancer patients who were HER2 normal. At the time this study was done, it was particularly troubling to see this outcome because we had no remedy for this HER2 positive status in the patients. So this description was scientifically compelling, but in terms of drug development, it also outlined for us an unmet need. 
a difficult situation for patients that potentially we could fix. So here's the molecule that allowed us to think about addressing this HER2 positive or HER2 overexpressing breast cancer. And this is the, the picture or a cartoon showing trastuzumab. Trastuzumab is the USAN name or what some people call the generic name for Herceptin. I'm gonna use Herceptin because it's less of a mouthful. But this is the monoclonal antibody. And monoclonal antibodies at the time that Herceptin was developed were thought to be kind of a pie in the sky dream for a smart bullet, a, a guided missile targeted to certain things like HER2 that were expressed on cancer cells. And the beauty of Herceptin was that this monoclonal antibody was humanized. Most of the antibody, greater than 90%, was human. Less than 10%, in fact, in this case, about 7%, was murine. And that meant that unlike some of the early antibodies, human beings didn't reject the antibody as foreign. So Herceptin was a humanized monoclonal antibody that specifically targeted HER2, allowing us to test the hypothesis, if we direct an antibody against HER2, can we improve outcomes in women with HER2 positive breast cancer? So this is a slide that shows you the development timeline for Herceptin. And a couple points I want to make on this slide. You notice the slide is a very long timeline. It takes a lot of time to do great drug development. And that's because each step along the way, you ask and answer specific questions. Now, the first study of Herceptin was all the way back in 1991. And that's when the investigational new drug, or IND, was filed to ask FDA we want to do clinical trials with this new concept for patients in the clinic. By 1994, the phase two studies were being done based on an early read that this was safe enough to give patients. In phase two, you ask, is this medicine going to help patients? Does it look promising? And you start to figure out the dose for which you're going to do the most important phase of testing or phase three, which opened up in 1995. What, the other things that are shown in this slide as we get into the late 90s and then into the 2000s are a series of steps with the regulators, with the U.S. regulators in, in terms of filing a BLA or a biologic license application and with the ex-U.S. regulators. And what this shows is that something had to be done that's special with a targeted therapy. And that special thing is filing both Herceptin or Trastuzumab approval and her SEP test. This makes drug development even more challenging. You have to ask for approval of your product, Herceptin, and simultaneously ask for approval for your diagnostic, her SEP test. These were both concurrently approved in 1998 in the metastatic setting, or breast cancer that has spread, and then not until 2005 did FDA approve Herceptin in the adjuvant setting or following primary surgery as adjunctive to standard chemotherapy. Now, the HER2 testing part of the Herceptin experience was a critical part of the lessons I learned about product development when I worked on Herceptin. And what this slide shows you is a great example of why a diagnostic matters so much. It actually makes drug development cheaper and faster. And why is that? Well, this is a statistical representation of what might have been with the Herceptin study. In patients whose breast cancer has spread, metastatic breast cancer, or MBC, we knew before Herceptin, median survival was 22 months. So 50% of patients had died by 22 months when you studied first-line metastatic breast cancer. Let's say that we expected the benefit of Herceptin to be to extend that survival from 22 months to 27 months, or a five-month improvement in survival. Well, if everyone in the study, or 100% of the patients, were HER2 positive, that five-month difference would take about 1,250 patients and 52 months duration of study. If we didn't have the diagnostic test, and truth was that only 25% of our study population had HER2 overexpression, that study would have shown an only a 1.25 month difference 
and taken 349 months and 11,000 patients. We couldn't have done that study. That study wasn't possible. So the diagnostic allowed for a smaller patient group and a faster study. And here's the answer to the question, does Herceptin help women with metastatic breast cancer? The great news is the answer is yes. In fact, as we had predicted, the median survival extended from 20.3 months to 25.4 months, a 25% improvement in survival in women with metastatic breast cancer, all of whom were HER2 positive when treated with Herceptin. Even better news came when we studied Herceptin early on, the adjuvant setting. The time to first distant recurrence doubled. The time that women stayed in remission doubled when Herceptin was given just after surgery. And this news was so dramatic that it got a standing ovation when it was presented for the first time. In my experience, the first time I've ever seen a standing O at a medical meeting. Great news for patients treated with Herceptin. Here's the New England Journal article that talked about that great news for women in the adjuvant setting, HER2 positive, treated with Herceptin. And the most important thing that I want to point out in this New England Journal article is the last line. This will completely alter our approach to the treatment of breast cancer. Now you have to ask, is the patient HER2 positive? Can you help women by targeting this scientifically based new therapy at what could become the Achilles heel of the cancer? And the answer was yes. So let me come back to the key things. We understood the science. We had the right drug. We targeted the right patients, set a high bar survival in the clinic, and we worked all the way along the line with the Food and Drug Administration. And the best thing about working on Herceptin and the experience I had was I know now hundreds of thousands of patients are gonna benefit from this work. And that's the best news of all in great drug development.